Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our uh, speaker today, Professor Jenny Green, uh, who many of you know. Uh, Jenny uh, got her uh, bachelor's degree from Yale um, in uh, uh, 2000 and then uh, came here to Harvard in 2001 uh, where she worked on a PhD thesis with John Hakra and uh, Louis Ho at Carnegie on the growth of uh, supermassive black holes, which she completed in 2006. Uh, Jenny then moved to uh, uh, Carnegie and Princeton as a joint Carnegie Princeton fellow in 2006 through 2010. Uh, and I think that's where we uh, uh, overlapped. Um, and then went to uh, UT Austin in 2010 uh, as an assistant professor and from there moved to Princeton in 2011 where she is now. Um, Jenny won several prestigious awards. Uh, she won the um, uh, Sloan Fellowship recently and uh, the Annie Jump Cannon Prize uh, from the American Astronomical Society in 2008. And the most important prize, uh, the Bach Prize from the Harvard Astronomy Department for her thesis work. Uh, in 2009. Uh, Jenny has done a lot of work on uh, the growth of supermassive black holes and the related uh, evolution of galaxies and today she's going to tell us uh, how to make an elliptical galaxy and uh, after the talk you will all be able to go home and make one yourselves. <laughs> I'm not promising that. So it's great to be here. I have lots of fond memories of sitting in the back as a Surly graduate student so I'm really happy to be back and the weather is absolutely perfect. So I want to talk about two important aspects of building elliptical galaxies. The first is how do they get their stars? We're told that at a given mass, elliptical galaxies were factors of four smaller at redshift two than they are today. I want to use sensitive observations of the outer parts, the st stars in the outskirts of elliptical galaxies today to try to figure out how that size growth occurred. We also know that something has to set the size scale for elliptical galaxies, keep them from getting too large, and I want to investigate whether or not black hole feedback may be responsible for that. So the first part of my talk is about the stellar outskirts of massive elliptical galaxies. This is a, pr a program I started in Austin with a bunch of UT folks. I just want to highlight specifically Jeremy Murphy, who's now an NSF fellow at Princeton, and he's done quite a lot of the work that I will present today. Also Genevieve Graves, who is another postdoc with us at Princeton. So, Elliptical galaxies, what do we know? Well, they've got round elliptical isophotes. They're smooth. The stars are supported predominantly by random motions. And the stars are mostly old. They also lack cold gas for future star formation. So actually, elliptical galaxies are pretty boring. Okay? And it, by rights, if there were any galaxy population in the present universe that we should understand, you'd think it would be these. They also comprise the most massive galaxies in the universe today, so we like to understand how they evolved. We know they're virialized systems, so they obey tight scaling relations between their sizes, their masses, and their velocity dispersions. This is one projection of the so-called fundamental plane, the Faber-Jackson relation, looking at the velocity dispersion versus the stellar mass here. What's kind of interesting is that the stellar populations also participate in these scaling relations. And this is just one way of looking at that. This is the magnesium sigma relation. So this is just the depth of a magnesium line, which is telling you that both the metal content and the alpha abundances rise as you go to more and more massive elliptical galaxies. And so if you study the stellar populations of ellipticals in some detail, you find these very nice trends in the stellar populations. Let's just focus on this bottom panel here which is telling us that the most massive ellipticals form their stars earliest and most rapidly. So very short star formation timescales. While as you march to progressively lower masses, you see that the star formation histories are progressively more protracted. However, the important thing to point out here, or what I would like to emphasize, is that all of these observations are based on the very bright central regions of elliptical galaxies. Because it's hard to study their faint outer parts. <laughs> However, one could easily make the argument that there, if there were any part of the elliptical galaxy that was going to teach us 
about how the thing evolved, it would be the outer parts. And this is because recent observations are really convincingly showing that at fixed mass, ellipticals were factors of force smaller at redshift 2 than they are today. So this is just looking at the stellar mass versus size for Sloan ellipticals, and these are the redshift 2 galaxies. Now, there's lots of theoretical evidence that suggests that elliptical galaxies grew in size by shredding satellites as they fall in. Okay? So this is looking at single 10 to 1 satellite mergers from Mike Boylan Colchin and Chung Pei. It's a very complicated figure. You can ask her about it. But it's basically just showing the change in mass profile as a function of radius when you throw one satellite at a time into a big galaxy. And the only point I want to make here is that, indeed, mass is always added at large radius. From cosmological simulations, you see a similar story. At early times, most of the stars are formed in the host halo, while at late times, most of this, the mass growth occurs from stars that are accreted. And if you go to cosmological zoom simulations, you see, again, that at high redshift, you make these very compact nuggets, as people like to call them, while as you progress to lower and lower redshift, more and more of the stars are coming in in satellites, which are being shredded at large radius and growing the elliptical in size. You can then ask, when are the stars formed in these satellites? And the, the simulations tell us that the stars are made early, but then accreted late. Okay? So the stars in the outer parts, I won't quite call this a, a prediction, but these stars should be old, older than the central regions, perhaps, and quite metal poor. So I'm by no means the first person to think of looking at color gradients in elliptical galaxies. What do the observations say? People have been doing this for more than 40 years. Well, now just focusing on the red lines here, which are showing age, metallicity, and alpha abundance ratios as a function of radius, we find that the ages are old. Okay? The metal content is declining slowly, about a couple tenths of a dec per decade in radius. And we find flat alpha to iron abundance ratio gradients. But again, the vast majority of the observations are focused on the very bright central region, so going out only to about the half-light radius. Whereas most of the size growth we think happened out here at twice the effective radius, this figure demonstrates why it's so hard to study that light. Okay, so this is just the surface brightness profile of a typical elliptical galaxy, and this is the sky. So we're trying to work factors of a few below the sky to get to the stellar signal that we're really interested in. And if you use classic techniques, you just put down a long slit here, you can see that the effective area on the sky out in the region that we're interested in is tiny. And so we have to work very, very hard against the sky to use these classic techniques. Or we can change techniques and use integral field spectroscopy. And this is what we're doing. So this is the footprint of our instrument, which is for, uh, officially known as the George and Mariah Mitchell Visible Integral Field Replicable Unit Prototype, but I know it as Virus P, so that's what I'll call it. It's two arc minutes on the, on the sky. Each of these circles gives us a spectrum. It's four arc second fibers with one third fill. So we dither three times to fill in the field of view completely. And this was built as a prototype for the instrument virus that's going to be looking for dark energy at redshift 2 to 3, but what it actually is is an excellent light bucket. So it's perfect for measuring the faint outer parts of ellipticals, and it's been used already to quite good success. Jeremy Murphy has been using it to measure stellar kinematics in the outer halos of massive ellipticals to weigh the dark matter halo. And Chung Pei and Nicholas McConnell have been playing a similar game, but their interest has been in weighing supermassive black holes, and I think you may have heard a little bit about that earlier this semester. So we wanted a program that would be complementary. We wanted elliptical galaxies that would fit in one virus P pointing. We wanted them to have high velocity dispersion so that we could spectrally resolve them. And we spent only three total hours per galaxy, <coughs> including sky nods. So this was pretty cheap, two hours of integration time per galaxy. And so we started with a pilot survey of eight galaxies, which we published in 2012. And I'll show you work based on 33 galaxies, which I just published. We'll, we're about up to 75 by the end of the current observing run. Now, you might well ask, 
Aren't there lots of integral field spectrograph surveys out there right now? What do you really have to add? And this slide is meant to demonstrate the two things that we add. So Atlas 3D has been looking at the centers of, of elliptical galaxies, a volume-limited survey. Most of their ellipticals are small. They're typically looking at s zeros. So compared to them, we cover much more massive systems with higher velocity dispersions, and we also look much further out. And as I was arguing, I think that's where the interesting information is. It tells us about both the stellar halo and the dark matter halo. And this slide is just to show how we win. So if I take a single fiber out here in the faint outer parts of the elliptical, you see this is the sky spectrum, and this is the data. So that's not really that impressive. But if I co-add in an annulus, then I get this beautiful high signal to noise data all the way out to two and a half times the, the half-light radius. So what are we measuring? You know, I'm at a pure theory department now. So I like to tell my colleagues to first look at the data. These are composite spectra now as a function of effective radius. So in, at each spectrum, I've co-added all the high dispersion galaxies in my sample here and all the low dispersion galaxies in my sample here. So these are beautiful spectra. You can see, if you've looked at enough, that these are old and you don't see very much variation as you go outward. So where's the information content? And to show that, we just made these ratio spectra dividing at each radius by the spectrum at the effective radius, which just <laughs> highlights what is changing as you go out, okay? And you can see these little emission features tell you something's getting weaker, all right? And so what's getting weaker are these molecular bands. CN, the swan bands, and this magnesium band here. So mostly those get weaker because as I told you, the metal content is dropping as you go outward. But there are also interesting changes in the abundance ratios, which I'll show you in a moment. So the first thing we did was completely model independent, which is just to look at this magnesium sigma relation. And here's what you get from Sloan in the dotted lines. And the red points are what we get within half RE for our sample. Okay? The blue symbols now are what we measure way out at 2.5 RE. So we can just ask the simple-minded question, if I make these outskirts by shredding smaller galaxies, what's the typical mass ratio that I need? And the answer is something like 10 to 1 mergers. So just to preserve this correlation between the magnesium equivalent width and sigma at large radius, we're typically pulling apart galaxies that are a factor of 10 smaller to make these stellar halos. But now I'd like to argue that the story is actually not so simple. We're never really pulling apart smaller ellipticals as we know them today, and let me show you why. So from these spectra, we're trying to figure out the stellar population properties, the ages, the metallicities, and these abundance ratios, the ratios of alpha to iron. And these are particularly interesting because they tell us how the stars formed, and particularly how quickly. And the reason is that you make your alpha elements, such as oxygen and magnesium, in type 2 supernovae, right? Well, you make the iron peak elements in type 1As. So if you can make your stellar population quickly enough, you keep this very high ratio of alpha to iron. But the minute you start to have an extended star formation history, you pollute the gas with iron, and the alpha to iron ratio starts to progressively fall. So we think of alpha to iron as a clock. You need to make your stars in something like 200 million years to preserve this high ratio of alpha to iron. And in fact, the result that I showed you at the beginning from Thomas et al. is based on the fact that alpha to iron rises steeply as a function of velocity dispersion in ellipticals. And so the most massive ellipticals form their stars both early and very rapidly. This is just a recent paper from Charlie Conroy and Genevieve Graves. All of these different lines are different models, which all find alpha to iron rising in the centers of ellipticals. Now I'm just going to look at these two velocity dispersion bins as a function of radius now, 
what's happening in the outer parts of these same galaxies. And that's shown here. On the left, we're looking at a function as a function of physical radius in kiloparsecs, and on the right, scaled to the effective radius. The circles here are the high dispersion galaxies, the squares are the low dispersion galaxies. So in the centers, we recover well-known trends with velocity dispersion, but what we're interested in is the radial behavior. So first of all, we find that all the way out to 2.5 RE, the stars are old, and they stay old. Okay? We find that these same metallicity gradients that we saw within RE are preserved all the way out to 2.5 RE, so about a couple tenths of a dec per decade in radius. And these abundance ratios remain flat. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the stars in the outer parts of these ellipticals look nothing like stars in the centers of any galaxies today. And that's summarized here in this figure, where I'm showing alpha to iron now versus Fe over H. The stars are all the elliptical galaxies centers from Genevieve Graves' thesis. Okay? So as you go from low sigma to high sigma, you track out this region of alpha to iron versus Fe over H. The centers of our galaxies, here are the high dispersion and low dispersion galaxies, live in this regime here. But as we go outwards, we stay high in alpha to iron, but progressively lower in Fe over H. So these stars, it's the, the picture that we've ripped apart smaller galaxies today simply does not apply. But I'm also showing a bunch of dots in this picture, OK? These are Milky Way disk stars, the small symbols. And then Milky Way thick disk stars are the open squares. So basically, the stars in the outer parts of these ellipticals resemble nothing better than thick disk stars. And so the picture that we put forward is imagine you're a galaxy that may become the Milky Way. You start forming your bulge and your thick disk. And then instead of progressing to the present, accreting gas and happily making disk stars, you fall into the halo of a big galaxy. Well, now you no longer have a gas supply. So your alpha elements and ages are imprinted from that early phase when you made your thick disk. So you look like a Milky Way galaxy whose star formation was truncated very early. And then that disky galaxy is shredded in the outer parts of the big elliptical. So that's the story we put forward to explain the stellar population properties that we observe. And it's a nice story, and it makes Jerry Ostreicher happy, which makes everybody happy, right? But it is certainly not a unique story. And here's one of the observations that bothers me that I don't think is trivially explained in a hierarchical picture. This is the famous no escape from the escape paper from Scott, the Sauron team. There's an update from 2013. It's, again, a busy plot. So we're back to this magnesium index, which again is telling you about the metal content and the alpha abundances, but now plotted against the local escape velocity in individual galaxies. So you can just ask how the metal content changes as the escape velocity goes down outwards this way. And what people make a big deal about, all the way back to Marine Franks, is that the slope of this V-escape <coughs> magnesium relationship for individual galaxies is the same as the slope that you get for integrated galaxies overall. <coughs> Anytime you see a trend with local escape velocity, it looks an awful lot like it has to know about what happened locally, where the stars were formed not in some other halo, but there locally. Okay? And so explaining this V escape relation is sort of a challenge for a purely hierarchical model of, of galaxy evolution. You could imagine doing this. For instance, you can imagine that stars are preferentially stripped as they fall into a bigger halo at a place that knows about the potential that they were made in. So it's not impossible to explain these trends hierarchically. It's just, it's just a challenge. Another thing that we can do, instead of just looking at the alpha to iron abundance ratios, is look at individual elements. 
And so we did this also in our paper in 2013, carbon to iron, nitrogen to iron, calcium to iron, again, as a function of radius. And I was going to leave this slide out of my talk because it turns out we don't really know how important things like massive star winds versus supernova yields are in forming these elements, which makes interpreting these plots very difficult. We also find a ridiculously high nitrogen to iron abundance ratios, which don't vary at all as a function of radius, and I find this completely baffling. But even not completely understanding the yields, we could hope to match these detailed abundance ratios with other stars. So I'll give you one example. Where else do we see really high nitrogen abundances at low metallicity? It turns out globular clusters. So halo stars don't show a, a large spread in nitrogen to iron, but globular cluster stars apparently do. So I was talking to Paul Godfroyd when I was at Space Telescope, and he said, well, I think what your observations are telling us is that the entire elliptical was made by shredding globular clusters. And I said, that's completely crazy. But then I sort of thought about it, you know, we're trying to make all of the stars in 200 million years or less. So maybe this is such an extreme star formation environment that you really are making most of the stars in very small, dense clusters, which allows you to retain some of your nitrogen and gives you these high nitrogen abundances. So anyway, I thought that was a fun thing to think about, so I'll share that with you. We have other information, of course, because we know about the kinematics of the stars, which will hopefully also tell us about how the mass came in at large radius. And in particular, you know that ellipticals have varying levels of angular momentum in their outer parts, and we can separate them into those that don't rotate and those that do. And perhaps the rotators had more dissipational formation in their outer parts, and that might be imprinted in their star formation histories. So we tried binning by fast and slow rotator here. That's the circles and the squares. And it turns out we see no differences at all. This is work that Sudhir Rascuti is doing with me in Princeton, and it's still in preparation. So this is where we are in the question of how ellipticals get their stars. We've seen that the stellar populations in the outer parts of ellipticals are different from the centers of any galaxies today, and we suggest that they were formed basically as pr proto-disks. They were making thick disks, and then their star formation histories were truncated. What you would really like, what you would really like is a nice volume-limited sample of the most massive elliptical galaxies in the universe today. And so Chung Pei and Jeremy and Nicholas and I are gathering our resources to put together just such a sample. And here they are in red, the 100 most massive ellipticals within 100 megaparsecs. This, for context, is M87, our local big galaxy. And this is NGC 4889, the, the BCG of, of uh, Coma. And these in stars are the galaxies that we've already observed, because Jeremy Murphy is at the telescope as we speak. For those of you who like to observe, this is a real telescope where you have to move the dome by hand. Okay, so he's working very hard for us all week, getting new observations. We're excited. Okay, so let me get to part two of my talk now. How do ellipticals lose their gas? And this is work I've been doing since 2006 in collaboration with Nadia Zakomska and now her postdoc, Gulin Liu, both at Johns Hopkins. And you know the story. In the early 2000s, galaxy formation theorists were having a lot of trouble making galaxies. Their galaxies were too big and too blue. And they realized that AGN could solve all their problems because you only need a fraction, maybe a hundredth, of the binding energy in the black hole, and you can unbind the whole galaxy. So if you can just tap into a little bit of that energy, you can get rid of all of these problems and make galaxies that are red and not too big. This is not a crazy idea. We know that black holes and stars basically formed at the same time at around a redshift of two. And we see tight scaling relations between black holes and bulges today, and something had to establish that correlation so maybe it was AGN feedback. But in practice, actually seeing evidence of radiation-dominated, bright, growing black holes 
impacting their host galaxies on galaxy-wide scales turns out to be very challenging. If you look in the radio, I think the case is clear. A lot of the work has, was done here by some of your furloughed colleagues looking at radio clusters, radio emission from clusters where you see that it really, these radio bubbles really are keeping the cluster gas hot. We also see powerful radio jets which entrain the warm ISM in their galaxies and carry them out to kiloparsec scales or even further. However, powerful radio jets are rare and so it isn't clear that they're cosmologically important. Why is this such a hard problem? One of the big challenges we face is that we know that star formation drives powerful winds. We can see it in M82, for example. So if we now go and look at a powerful quasar, where presumably there's also lots of star formation going on, it's really hard to say whether the winds we observe are powered by star formation or powered by the AGN. You also really have to worry about what scale you're looking on. There's really, I think, compelling evidence that black holes can limit their own growth on sort of Schwarzschild scales. They drive these disk winds. We see broad absorption line quasars with 10,000 kilometer per second outflows. It seems clear that the black hole exerts feedback on these scales. But what I'm really interested in in this talk is kiloparsec scales, where it influences the growth of the entire galaxy. We also have the problem that it depends on what phase of the gas you look at. So I'm going to look at ionized gas in the optical because it's cheap and easy to do. But perhaps all the outflows are coming out in the x-ray or in these beautiful molecular outflows that people have been finding recently and will find more of with ALMA. All right. So just to remind you, I'm going to be talking about obscured quasars. What does that mean? Well, unobscured quasars when you see the accretion disk and the broadline region, the dense gas orbiting the black hole. And so this is what you see in nice power law and these broad emission lines. In an obscured quasar, nature kindly puts some gas cloud between us and the accretion disk. So we can not only see that an accreting black hole is present based on how it excites the gas in the galaxy, but we can also study the galaxy itself. So these are really the type of sources we want if we want to study what the black hole is doing to the galaxy. And when I started this project, Nadia Zakomska had just gone through Sloan and picked out the most luminous obscured quasars out to a redshift of 0.8 using this oxygen line at 5007 as an indicator of the luminosity. And she had studied these sources over a wide range of wavelengths from X-rays to Spitzer, so we know a lot about them already. And so we set out to study the spatially resolved warm ISM in these galaxies using long slit observations with Magellan. And I think my first epic of observations was still with Harvard Time. So you can feel a little bit of ownership of this project. So we took all these long slit data. I won't talk very much about those data. I'll say a little bit. I really want to focus on our more recent integral field spectroscopy. So here's my favorite object that we found with the Magellan data. This is a ULURG. You can see two nuclei here. This northern nucleus is definitely an AGN. And Julie Comerford is trying to decide whether or not this guy is an accreting black hole as well. But what I'm interested in is this green smudgy stuff you can see in the HST image. And if you put a slit down on it, OK, you see this perfectly round expanding bubble. This is about 20 kiloparsecs across. And you're seeing wavelength increasing this way. So you're seeing this expanding bubble. And I can't help but point out this is exactly how Lars told us it was supposed to happen, right? Two galaxies come together, the black holes grow, and then they heat up the gas until it explodes like a bomb. So we're seeing sort of the shell of this outflow, but we're imagining that underneath is a hot, expanding bubble of gas that's being blown by the central black hole. And if we just assume that this expands like a supernova remnant, we get kinetic luminosities of 10 to the 44 to 10 to the 46. We can ask, well, can you blow this bubble through star formation? The answer is yes, it's marginally possible based on the mid and far infrared luminosity, but difficult. There is no jet. There's a tiny radio source that's unresolved, so we can't be blowing this with a jet. 
So we try to argue that we're actually seeing a radiation-driven outflow in this, in this source. Two exciting new developments. One is that you stare hard enough at the x-ray observation here, and all these red dots are the soft x-rays, which seem to be spatially coincident with the outflow that we're seeing in ionized gas. So there's some possibility that we're actually seeing the hot, expanding medium that's driving the outflow. We also now have ALMA data. We see no molecular outflow. We see some turbulence in a disk here and maybe some tidal stuff, but it looks like the dense gas is living right here, exactly where you would need it to pinch the outflow right at the center. This is work that Ilay Sun, my graduate student, is doing. She's incredibly energetic, so expect to see a paper soon. All right, so that's one object, and it's cool, but what can we say about the population in general? And what I'm showing you here is the intensity of the oxygen three line as a function of position. So this is our GMOS IFU data, and we basically just looked at the most luminous obscured quasars that money can buy at redshift 0.6. So that was the only selection. And these are, this is a 10 kiloparsec scale bar, so these are all at the same physical size. And what you see are completely round, 20 kiloparsec sized ionized regions around every single one of these luminous obscured quasars. So first surprise is that if you see it, we're looking at obscured quasars, we expect to see ionization cones. But instead, obviously the ionization is getting out because it's completely round. What are they doing kinematically? So now I'm showing you velocity gradients and line widths for some of the sources. I know the numbers are hard to see, but we typically see very small velocity gradients, 40 to 50 kilometers per second. Whereas the line widths are broad, typically 800 to 1,000 kilometers per second, and not just in the center, in the middle of the galaxy, but all the way out to 20 kiloparsecs. So we're seeing these ubiquitous, round, ionized nebulae with gas velocities of 800 to 1,000 kilometers per second all the way out to 20 kiloparsecs. And those are the observations. This just shows the velocity dispersions, which basically don't drop as we go out in radius. And I actually made a big deal about this in the long slit papers, but those were long slit. Nobody believed them. Now that we have the IFU data, you can really see it. So something is stirring up the gas in the outer parts of these nebulae. So now I'm going to give you an interpretation. Those were the observations. How can we interpret this? Well, first of all, as I said, we don't really see velocity gradients. So it seems implausible that we're seeing gigantic rotating disks. Instead, it seems likely that we're seeing some sort of quasi-spherical thing. And I'm going to interpret the observations now in the context of an outflow model. And if we have the picture that the gas is flowing outward, then we can just relate the velocity dispersion directly to a bulk velocity. We can take the typical line width to just estimate a lower limit on the kinetic luminosity, just mv squared. And that comes to a few times 10 to the 47 ergs over a li typical lifetimes of 10 to the 7 years. And so because we don't really know the mass in ionized gas, this is something like a, a strict lower limit on, on the energy input from the black. We can actually do a little bit better because it turns out that the O3 emission region has a limited size. And this is work that Kevin Henlin and Ryan Hickox have been doing. Many of you also know Ryan Hickox. So if we now just look at the size of the O3 emission region as a function of the wise luminosity of the quasar, we see that as you go to progressively higher luminosities, the sizes stay basically the same. Okay. So that has important implications if you like to use O3 as a bolometric indicator for your AGN, but that's a different talk. What we're interested in is what's actually setting that size. And the idea is something like this. Basically, as you go outward, the typical size of your cloud is going to rise. And you're going to go from a regime where you're just seeing the skin of the cloud to where the, you're ionizing the entire cloud and then beginning to over-ionize it. So we're basically seeing a transition from ionization bounded to matter bounded. And we're fairly confident this is what hap is happening because as the O3 to H beta drops, the helium to H beta rises. And this means that right at this transition, we can think that we're seeing all the ionized gas 
and use that to get a handle on the mass. And so if we just accept this model where the AGN is actually moving all of the gas out to this radius, we can now estimate how much energy it would take to do that, and you get luminosities, kinetic luminosities of 10 to the 44 to 10 to the 45, which are plotted here on the y-axis versus estimates for the bolometric luminosity of the AGN coming from the disk, which are estimated from the 12 micron, and those have also a large error bar. So the punchline here is if you want to believe that the AGN is driving an outflow and actually moving the gas all the way out to 15 kiloparsecs, we're talking about a few percent of the bolometric luminosity coming out in kinetic luminosity. So are we seeing evidence for AGN feedback? Well, we look at these luminous quasars, and in all cases, we see these round ionized nebulae. Something is stirring up the gas out there. It's got broad line widths of 800 kilometers per second. And if we put in this simple spherical outflow model, we're talking about 5% or so of the bolometric luminosity coming out as kinetic luminosity. What sort of worries me are all these beautiful observations from background quasars of the outer circumgalactic medium, which also show gas motions and turbulence in all galaxies, red or blue. And so we're just lighting up the inner part of these halos compared to what cos halos is seeing. And I wonder if, you didn't, if the AGN didn't do anything at all, but you just used the AGN as a light bulb, whether we wouldn't see exactly the same thing, this sort of turbulent gas flows out at large radius. So I think we're getting closer, but maybe are not quite to the point where we can say for sure that the AGN is driving, driving these outflows. There's lots of fun stuff coming. Gulin has been looking at now unobscured quasars of comparable luminosity. It seems like the ionized regions look the same both in size and in kinematics, so that should be coming out soon. We're also now trying to find obscured luminous quasars, not just at redshift of a half, but out at redshift two where really the action was. And so Michael Strauss and Rachel Alexandrov, who is now a graduate student at Hopkins, went through BOSS and picked out these luminous obscured quasar candidates, which we've now been following up with, with FIRE at Magellan and also triple spec to try and figure out what we're, what we're seeing. So that, that's also kind of nice. All right. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to put together the first two parts of the talk. What happens when you combine hierarchical merging with supermassive black holes? You should get supermassive black hole binaries. And this is a search for supermassive black hole binaries that Wendy Ju did with me at Princeton. She's now moving on to do radiation MHD uh, with Jim Stone, so keep your eye on her. She can join the great ranks here of postdocs. Okay, so we have lots of good reasons to think that black hole binaries form. Massive galaxies all contain supermassive black holes, and we know that galaxies merge. There's also indirect evidence for binary black holes. If you look at the light profiles of low-mass ellipticals, they rise all the way to the center. But the most massive ellipticals seem to have a light excess, a light deficit, perhaps scoured by a black hole binary as it migrates in. The big question, and it's been a question for a long time since Bagelman and all 1980, is how long do these black hole binaries live? And the problem is that if you live in a perfectly axisymmetric stellar system, you're going to run out of stars at around a parsec. And you're not going to have anything around anymore to get rid of more angular momentum. And you need to go down three more orders of magnitude before gravitational radiation can help you merge. So embarrassingly enough, we can't really say whether all black supermassive black holes are composed of these parsec scale binaries. And we can't tell our gravitational radiation colleagues whether they're going to see anything with their telescopes. So they would really like to know. Just before I start, I want to give you a sense of scale. So what I'm talking about for this part of the talk is the broad line region, which is this dense gas that orbits the black hole at distances of about 0.1 parsecs to a parsec for the luminosities that I'll be talking about. Earlier in the talk, I was talking about the narrow line region, which is way further out at kiloparsec scales. You've also probably heard quite a lot about these pairs of AGN that we like to call dual AGN, which again are on kiloparsec scales. This 
Shin Lu and Yue Shen and I and Michael Strauss were picking these out of Sloan. Julie comerford has been studying them at a wide range of redshifts. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about subparsec scale pairs. And the number of confirmed such binary black holes is so small that whenever you give one of these talks, you're compelled to list every single possible candidate. So this is our best option. This is a pair of radio cores found with VLBI with a seven parsec separation. Pretty compelling case for a pair of black holes. Then there are a bunch of weirdo objects that people have picked out of Sloan. And here what's happening is that the narrow line region we think sitting out in kiloparsec scales is tracing the systemic velocity of the galaxy. And sometimes you find these broad emission lines with gigantic velocity offsets. A thousand kilometers per second offset. So lots of things could be going on, but it's really enticing to think you're seeing orbital motion. So orbital motion between the broad and the narrow lines, perhaps one of a pair of orbiting black holes. So this is some of the first candidates people picked out. And I've listed a whole bunch of references here because as many, many more alternative explanations are available than just a binary black hole in each case. But now people are trying to be a bit more systematic. So Mike Araclius and Todd Borison have gone through Sloan. They've picked out everything with a large velocity offset between the narrow and the broad lines. And now they're monitoring them with time. So they're looking for spectroscopic binaries. And the Carling collaborators have also been doing this. The problem is that they're picking systems with a very large velocity offset between the narrow and the broad lines. So by definition, you have to wait a long time before you see any interesting radial velocity changes. So I was sitting there listening to this talk by Todd Borison, and I thought, well, why don't we just start with all quasars and then look for radial velocity changes with time? Then we won't be preferentially picking these weirdos, and we can just use every single quasar that has multiple observations. Okay? So that's the idea. You just wait until the black hole binary moves a little bit, and the spectral lines should shift with time. And Yue Shen and Avi have also been working along similar lines with a slightly different selection. So we went to Sloan and we picked out the 2,000 objects that had been observed multiple times with time intervals ranging from you know, days all the way to six years. These are luminous quasars at redshift one to two, so their typical black hole masses are a few times 10 to the eight. And then we just cross-correlate the two epochs and we look for velocity shifts. Okay? And so this is the full distribution of velocity shifts that we see for the entire sample. And so we interpret this width as coming from some combination of noise and actual flickering in single broadline regions. And we take the biggest outliers. <laughs> we try to be conservative by doing our cross correlations over multiple regions of the spectrum. And we end up with seven final candidates, which we treat as an upper limit. So what does this now tell us about the binary black hole population? So we first just ask, how many would we expect to find in our sample as a function of binary separation? So as the separation gets smaller, this black line just tells you the total number we would expect if every single quasar was in a binary. Okay? So at 0.1 parsecs, we would have expected a couple hundred if everything was a binary. However, the story is a little bit more complicated because we're not observing the black holes themselves. We're observing the broadline region. And we don't really know the size of the broadline region. And so just putting in these assumptions from, from Avi and Yue about the size of the broadline region gives us this region here. So we're actually only really sensitive to binaries at about 0.1 parsecs. And our observations, here's our upper limit. So this is telling us that only a fraction, maybe less than 30% or so, of these luminous quasars at redshifts 1 to 2 are in subparsec binaries. If we have now a prediction for how long the binary spends as a function of radius, we can do a little bit better with our expectations. So there are lots of ways you can imagine the binaries coming together. One is if you live, instead of in an axisymmetric stellar system, if you live in a triaxial 
stellar system, you, you continue to feed stars to the binary, it continues to spiral in. That's actually really hard to model. It depends on if you're in a merger or in a triaxial elliptical and so on. Or you can use gas. So if you have a gas disk, that will also, you can fling the gas out and merge. So this is just residence times from Roman Rafikov as a function of mass and separation, right? So if you're a few 10 to the 8, and you're starting your life at 0.1 parsecs, then in 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 years, you're going to get to the ra radius where gravitational radiation gets you in. Okay? So just integrating over these residence times then, we can ask what fraction of your sample, no matter how big it is, would you expect to see binaries in under the assumption that you're merging by, via gas disks, now as a function of how long between your first epoch and your second epoch. Okay. So this is our measurement here, and this black line is what you would expect for equal mass binary system. So we're already, as I said, down at something like 30% or less of the population. And these different lines are just showing you how sensitive our assumptions, how sensitive our results are to our assumptions about the size of the broad line region. So we have this very limited sample right now with time intervals of only about a year. But we can do much better. BOSS has actually reobserved 8,000 or maybe 9,000 quasars by now with typical time differences of eight years. So we can actually really start to eat into this interesting 0.1 parsec regime with much larger statistics and much larger time baselines. It's a little more complicated because they're looking at carbon-4, which is a pain to deal with, but we'll give that a try. The other thing is a very exciting project that we're working on now at Princeton, the prime focus spectrograph. And so I'm going to use my last two minutes to advertise this project. This is a spectrograph that Jim Gunn is building with our collaborators all over the world, our primary collaborators at IPMU, but also Brazil and Caltech and Hopkins and, and um, JPL. So why are these exciting? Well, it's a 1.3 square degree field of view. So we're going to look at 2,000 galaxies at a time. But what I'm really excited about is the wavelength coverage. We're going to use three channels so we can cover from 3,800 angstroms all the way to 1.26 microns, which means that there is no redshift desert for this spectrograph. We can observe galaxies from redshift 0 all the way to redshift 7 with no gaps. Okay? And that means that we can study the galaxy population at the peak of the star formation and black hole growth, so around redshift 1 to 2. And that's what we're really excited about. Uh, and these are just some example spectra. We're also going to have a BAO survey and a galaxy archaeology survey. But for free, we can reobserve all the Sloan quasars, basically. So that will give us an even longer time baseline. So we should actually be able to get down to duty cycles as low as 10 to the minus 4 for this subparsec population. And then we could really start to ask whether the gas-assisted merging or a triaxial merging is more consistent with the data if we can actually map out this duty cycle. So, so far, all we can say is that not all of these quasars live in binaries, but this is already more observations than we've had before. So that's already progress. With BOSS plus PFS, I think we'll do much better. However, as I was saying to Avi earlier, what really bothers me is what happens if we don't detect anything. Well, then we can't say there's no binaries. All we can really say is we can't see the quasars when they're in this subparsic phase. So that's the big caveat. And that uh, brings me to the end of my talk. I've talked about how stars get into the halos of elliptical galaxies. I've talked about ubiquitous ionized regions around obscured quasars and a little bit about black hole binaries. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, questions? Yeah. So in the past, uh, we've always thought, in the past we thought that the BCG and clusters was somehow different from other ellipticals. And uh, you seem to be presenting a picture in which they are simply a bit bigger. Um, are they really different or are they? Well, I think there's lots of ways in which BCGs are 
special. So they sort of have a different luminosity function. They have ICL around them, so their kinematics change. In my sample, let me say even stronger, in the family of observations of stellar populations at large radius, there's not enough information to say whether the BCGs are significantly different. And that's only because we just can't make enough environmental bins yet. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that, so everything in Chung Pei's sample, or many of the things in Chung Pei's sample are BCGs, a lot of the things that Jeremy Murphy's looking at, but mine is sort of a mix of BGGs and field and such, and so dicing by environment it just doesn't work yet. Because sigma is another variable, you need bins of sigma and environment, and I'm, I'm just not there yet. I'm a little bit confused how you used your um, magnesium to ion abundance ratio to conclude truncated star formation histories, because that assumes that you know what the delay time distribution of the type 1A supernovae is. And um, high redshift type 1A supernovae, at least, they tend to go off within a couple hundred million years. And so how you're probing truncated star formation histories with ages of truncation of 200 million years is kind of ambiguous. How do you, how do, you do this? So, I guess I would say that it, it, unless the time delay distribution is a strong function of redshift, I think what I say hold, just in a relative sense. So to get a higher alpha to iron, you need to, no matter what you do, you need to make the stars before most of the type 1As, right? You can do that just by changing the IMF. That is also true, but again, you'll have to do something systematic to the IMF as a function of radius if you want to explain the radial trends by changing the IMF. Right? So the alpha to iron is flat as a function of radius. Okay. Well, the issue is, I mean, how you form these elliptical galaxies, at least from the high-z viewpoint, is somewhat different from what you're presenting by doing spatial to resolve spectroscopy of individual ellipticals. Because when you look at redshift 2 to 4, the most massive galaxies aren't form, forming by mergers because the submillimeter galaxies aren't accounting for the elliptical number density in the local universe. It seems. You mean there's fact, not enough of them? There's not enough of them. Okay. It seems instead that the massive galaxies at high z are forming by constantly accreting gas at a quasi continuous rate. Okay. But so that forms the and core of And this is all happening before redshift 2. That's right? happening above redshift 2. Okay. But, I mean, you're specifically focusing on how you get this thin veneer of stellar population in the outskirts of the elliptical, but, which is a small part of the total mass, exactly. And so whether you necessarily get that by accreting a formed stellar population, which is like a 10 to 1 merger, as you're suggesting, right. or whether you accrete that as remnants of this accretion flow, which is falling into this, so this is massive what, system. I was really hoping that the kinematics would give us some clue in the sense that things that are rotating, perhaps it was more gaseous, while things that are really not rotating at all, those are the ones where you really think you've bombarded the thing with a bunch of small satellites. So I was hoping we would see differences in the stellar populations, but so far we haven't. But there is a buzzword okay, for let's, projector let's, bias. Let's keep this uh, discussion and take it offline okay. and have more questions. Yeah. I, I just had a question, Jenny, about how, what you assumed for the distribution of um, orbital planes for the binary black holes. Are you assuming that they're isotropic? Or because the quasars, we are presumably looking down the barrel. She was and assuming as result, that they were. You might, you might expect they that they would isotropic. all be in the plane of the sky. In which case, the probability of seeing might motions be lower. might be a lot lower. That's true. We certainly didn't put in an opening angle. We just assumed isotropic. That's very true. Uh, yeah, you mentioned a couple of examples that make theories happy. Do you have, do you have examples that make them unhappy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was trying to suggest that these, this V escape correlation may really be pointing to a different scenario, and specifically that there's gas coming in at late times and the stars are forming, at least some fractions of stars are forming in situ and the, the correlation is, is imprinted locally with the local escape velocity because that determines how much of your metals you use. Um, I think it's re related to the second question. So I'm just wondering when you 
uh, uh, studying the, the balances instead of normalize over iron, is it more sensible to not, not normalize over magnesium because magnesium is a better club for, for, for the evolution. Well, so again, the idea was supposed to be that the alphas are coming from the type 2s, whereas... Yeah, but when, when you study like car carbon over Fe, because people... Yes, are it might be smart to not look at carbon over Fe, but to look at carbon, carbon versus something magnesium. else, yeah, or carbon to hydrogen, yeah. right, hydrogen being. That, that one's asked about the huge O3 nebulae, so I'll ask Please that. do. Uh, um, first of all, that it's ubiquitous, so every quasar you look at has been on for several million years. That's right. So Which is, at some point, that's going to be interesting, right? You're getting <laughs> yeah, close. so let's just, and keeping in mind the somewhat major caveat that all of these were selected to be bright in 03. Yes, that was but that selection. doesn't tell you how long they've been on at all, necessarily. No, that's true. And I, well, for that point, I assume that they were selected on a nuclear 03, and this is not that's what right. we're detecting, so that's, that's right. a different selection. <coughs> and the other one was, you had constant velocity dispersion over the whole that's right. area. That's right. If this is an expanding spherical shell, then towards the edges you'd expect that velocity dispersion to shrink. So it goes down a little bit, but, but is it, it, enough it seems more? like, so we say in the paper, maybe you need to re-accelerate the gas at large radius or to keep the dispersion. Or maybe it's all turbulent motion. Or maybe it's all turbulent. That's right. I think I missed something that you can clarify. So if I understood the first part of your talk correctly, the abundance ratios in the thick disk of the Milky Way imply that those stars formed in a short star formation epoch. But then if they were dynamically excited over the age of the galaxy without contamination, that would then imply that we had a short amount of star formation, then nothing, and then recently the thin disk started forming. But that doesn't seem right, so where have I gone wrong? I was being fast and loose. And perhaps it was really just a different IMF, but the idea was that those stars have both low Fe over H and high alpha to iron, similar to the star, the average star in the outer parts of, of the elliptical. So that's the result. And the idea just is that the alpha to iron tells you that the stars had to form relatively quickly. So that those thick disk stars were made at redshift two. But then if you formed you know, more stars over the age of the solar system, I mean the age of the galaxy, right. and then you're continually <coughs> dynamically exciting them, why would the whole thick disk population look like that short star formation? Then? Well, so the thick disk <coughs> has a very wide range. The point is that none of the thin disk stars are, are up there, right? Because they're all forming out of gas with an extended, lots of type 1As have gone off. So I'm sure there are stars that kinematically look like the thick disk, but live down at low Fe over H and low alpha to iron. I mean, they're on that diagram as well. But as you go up, you get progressively more and more just thick disk stars. And then as you go over, you get progressively only halo stars. And those are the ones where you can start to see actually pristine stars. But we're, we're, our Fe over H is nowhere near as low as the halo halo of the Milky Way. Yes. Yes, you showed this double um, quasar with VLBI images, and it was only one example you said there was. Yeah. Out of how many observed? So there's a woman, Burke Spolauer, who's actually tried to do a systematic search through sort of the archive writ large of VLBI observations. Many of them are, I believe, taken as calibrators, so this can play with. Uh, but she, to my knowledge, has found zero more. I'm not going to be able to tell you what the denominator is, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 I don't remember. Um, sorry? There are quite many observed, so the fraction must be pretty small. It's pretty small, exactly. And it's redshift dependent and things like that. And so I don't actually remember the numbers. But that would be the place to look. And it's a null result, basically. OK, there are no other questions. Let's thank Jenny again.